that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. I think like leaving leaving the API like to work like it, like leaving the API like as ambiguous as possible, but still like we still need to define like some like criteria, some like hard things that like people can and cannot do. Um, but I think like as we move more into a world where it's like where we're factoring a lot of the SDK and where, where we're kind of like starting to define cleaner interfaces and that cleaner like interface separation between things, we'll start seeing that like if we need to introduce like a new API or if we need to like break an API or something like that, it's going to be a lot simpler than what it is now because right now it's like we have to touch half the we have to touch a, like a decent portion of the repo to get like many things done. Um, so. Yeah, Aaron, do you have any thoughts? I mean, I can talk about what needs to be changed in the SDK to support cross-lang. Um, I think I have a pretty good sense of that. I'm not sure what needs to be done to support ZK. So, so I mean, is that something worth sharing, or um, where are we going yeah. with this? Session? No, I think that I think that's super good. I think like um, talking about that. I think the the ZK stuff, like. Um, Pretty like you're you're deeper into zk. I was talking with John. John did John's like playing around with like zk technology, um, and I think that's like more far fetched. Um, and so like I think that uh, like we should do like step one first before we start figuring out how to do like the final step. Um, and as we go through step one, we can start researching like step two. Step two being the ZK stuff. And then if we need to adjust like any APIs in step one, we can also uh, make time for that as well. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I wouldn't say that like we need like to necessarily start thinking about zero knowledge, but like just we shouldn't like reach a point, like say next year, in which we say, oh shit, no, we need to like refactor this, this, and that because like we made some wrong assumption in initially. 100%. That's that's really that's that's really the only concern yeah i mean i think i think that's in, in general good as a principle like if we can identify we're going in a direction and maybe we don't get there for two years or three years but if we can identify that we're going in a direction and that certain decisions now will get us closer to that direction whereas other direct other decisions will make it harder to get there i think we should always err on the side of uh directions that will get us decisions that will make us get where we want to be are are better decisions and i think that's something that I I think we should be paying more attention to generally because I think sometimes like in the past we said, oh, well, this is where we want to be. This is too hard. Let's do something else. And then that something else ends up adding just adding more technical debt to the pile rather than um, removing it. So good point. Um, yeah. And if you can do if you can kind of do some research on the ZK side, that would and, and kind of evaluate things that are being proposed in that light, that would be great because I don't have the context. Um, I can, if you can point me to resources to study it, I can definitely look into that. But um, yeah, I would appreciate support in that. Um, totally, yes, yes. Um, okay, so I can give a brief overview of what sort of needs to be changed in the SDK as is to, to get to the cross lang stuff. Um, and I think it actually is, not a ton more than what we've already started um, doing with uh, Core API um, Dep Inject, which I know um, has become sort of controversial, but I, I think it's um, like app config Dep Inject was always considered part of this. Um, so I, I looked into this a little bit. I think that you know one of the big blockers is ADR thirty three being implemented, and and um, one of the blockers for me, which I think I think I have clarity on now, is like whether we're actually doing account rekeying. And it sounds like we are doing account rekeying, or at least we want to make a decision that would assume that account rekeying may happen, which is not what ADR33 assumes now. So like, I know what I need to do to refactor ADR33 to take into consideration account rekeying. Um, and so then I think it can move forward. Um, so yeah, ADR33, basically the ability to have cross-lang um, module communication, that's sort of the biggest blocker. And then also the proto-reflect stuff that is I think pretty close to the finish line now, like the get signer stuff, doing the, the sign bytes with amino amino JSON using protoreflect. Like the fact that transactions can be verified with dynamic protobuf messages using just the file descriptors rather than concrete types, like concrete amino types, is a big removes a big blocker to cross lang because 
once we have that, it means if your types are generated in Rust, all Go needs to have is the file descriptors to be able to verify those transactions. Um, it doesn't actually need to have generated code. Generated code, in addition, could maybe provide some performance boost. We can look into that. But like with the Protoflex stuff that, that Matt and I have been working on, we get pretty close to like the basic requirements from the transaction side of things. We do need to have full proto-reflex support for transaction um, processing. Like that's another kind of thing that we're getting close to. It's just, we need to finish these pieces to be able to tackle that. And then with ADR33, you could start having um, what I would call loaders. And so um, I'm using, like this is the term that comes to me if somebody has a, a better term that then we can change to that term. But um, like what I'm thinking of as a loader would be, um, Say the simplest one, which I think, you know, Mark made a good point that it, even if this isn't where we want to go to, like using gRPC as a way to just like proof of concept ability to cross lang could be something useful to explore where it's like, okay, we don't need to write in a lot, whole lot of Rust code or, you know, other language stuff for that. We could just say really dumb implementation, maybe not even intended for production is gRPC. So we could have a gRPC loader and then the loader would basically say, okay, tell me the endpoint that I need to talk to to load the module, and then I'm going to provide an, an endpoint for that module to make client calls. So basically, host opens endpoint for receiving calls from gRPC, the gRPC module. The gRPC module opens a server endpoint for um, message, like for messages to be sent to. And then I think with, there's all a few small changes to like how we do app config. Currently, app config requires Go module sort of registration. It's a pretty minor change, but app config then could load, could basically, you could have a module that, like you could start gRPC loader. gRPC loader could then register all the gRPC modules using the app config registration. And then app config can, can say, okay, gRPC loader load these modules and G the gRPC loader will then deal with the back and forth communication. Um, the gRPC loader would need to create some proxies for um, uh, things like store. And, and those are the details that we were talking about last time. So like there needs to be proxies for store and for things like begin and end blocker. We could define those just for gRPC loader or we could define them generically so that it's like services all the way down and the same service definitions can be used for Rust modules, gRPC, WASM, the, it's just the service call is over a different protocol. So gRPC is one service call. Rust FFI using zero copy is another, like, is another RPC protocol. Cosm Wasm FFI is another RPC protocol, but it's still the same service definition. Or we could have just service definitions that are specific to loaders. Um, like we could have the the Rust loader say, oh, we're actually going to have a different store store type that is custom for Rust, and we need to make decisions there. But I think that like there's some we're pretty close to having the changes in the SDK that would allow loaders to be created. And loaders could would be their sort of own mod, like Go module. They would live outside of SDK core. SDK core just allows loader, loaders. Anybody then could create a different type of loader if they wanted, it could live outside the SDK proper. Um, and so for DS is this sort of a module runtime. Yeah, you could think of it that way. Like if, if we're talking about runtimes, I was thinking about runtimes as for like consensus runtimes. And then modules, yeah, module runtime could be like a loader. So, and then the core API is kind of like the core API and the sort of runtime module. Core API itself is is kind of like defines the interface between okay, consensus runtimes expect modules that look like this, and loaders load modules that look like that, and that that kind of and then like the router infrastructure kind of deals with like the, the in-between space between like the runtimes and the loaders. Is that making sense to people? For me, I did, did, did to make it makes sense. sense. I think the, for me, the term loader is a little, doesn't quite fit because lo loader is kind of something that happens when you're starting something. And it sounds like this is gonna, like this loader would be operating you know, at runtime, right? Right. Well. I guess the reason I'm using loader is like um, you think of like like uh, dynamic link libraries, and so like you're calling load library when you do dynamic link library. So I'm thinking like, okay, well, it's the thing that calls DLL load, but yeah, I mean, it still stays resident in memory. So, all right, I, I just think we should have a different name for run if runtime is what we're using for consensus engines. Let's just use a different name for this so that 
people don't get confused. Yeah. I think, I think it definitely makes sense. Um, the, the approach definitely makes sense to me. The only question I have is like when you say services um, here, do you mean like proto services or do you, do you, would it be like non proto services? Yeah, I guess when I'm saying services, I mean services that are defined in proto files that okay. um, that don't need to have necessarily have gRPCs the RPC protocol because like again I think that's a common misconception like that yep. proto protocol proto buff itself doesn't stipulate that the the services are, are gRPC. Yeah. Um, yep. We could have different service like yeah so services all the way down means services of proto files we could have different service definitions like in flat buffers or whatever and support those too but that's a separate discussion. Make makes sense. I just wanted to just double check what you meant by services. Um, yeah, I think this makes a lot of sense um, to me. The the approach. I mean, the the, the question is like uh, the the immediate question off the top of my head is like client support. So it's like, do you see that like I, I there's potentially like two ways to do it. Either like the loader registers a like grpc service for registration or we expose some way for them to register like a proto message request and a proto message response but it's like they don't have to use like a proto service to like use to like send it to us it's like we kind of take that message response and message um and re message request and response then register it as a grpc service instead of like how it's done now Or so, like how, how did you like the, how, just like kind of like how did you envision like the client side stuff working? Client side, you mean like people that are transaction submitters or yeah, transaction submitters and like queries. Transaction submitters and queries wouldn't wouldn't change that. Like okay. from the client side, okay. nothing would change here. Um, yeah. It's still messages packed in transaction. If we want to explore that, that's a totally separate, you know, maybe that's auth working group stuff. You know, like. Well, well let, let's talk about like messages and transactions. It, it's just more yeah. so like uh, right now we have like this like register services and you register like a query and a um, message server. Yeah. And do, do you think do you so your, your approach is like it would stay the same as is there? Yeah, but what I wrote in the eight, in the eight, in the RFC three, which I think is still in draft, is that we would introduce two additional service types, um, and so another service type would be like a module, um, a module scope service. So, like in that case, each module could implement a like currently, okay, one service definition globally. So you can't have two modules define the bank message server. You can't have two modules do that. But if we define begin block and end block as service definitions, you'd want to type a service where every module could define a begin block and an end block. Um, every module could define in it, you know, could define the genesis services. Um, so that would be a third type of service. And then a fourth type of service would be like, um, or maybe that's enough. I, I need to go back to the RFC. I think I, think I was thinking like storage service like, a storage service is a service which is kind of like a virtual service that is just accessible by modules to like talk to the store to send events like an event service um but there's no outside like there's no clients that can talk to these services these are like not client facing does that make sense yeah that definitely um clears it up in my head let me just link to rfc3 here so we can see um So this this like RFC I think is very specific to like the FFI loader like Rust specifically Rust FFI so maybe there should be like one that's more generic about just like if we're going down a service definition path but again like there are questions like maybe maybe services w work fine for everything but not for storage or maybe they do work fine for storage um, would so. would the service here be like a key value service. Yeah, it would be like a KV store service. And I think I even 
do I have it in the RFC? Maybe not. Um, but I was like hypothesizing that, uh, oh yeah, there is a stored at proto. Um, yeah, you can see the proto files there. Like it just has a has, has request, get request, set request, delete. And then for iteration, iteration uses streaming, GRP, like using streaming services, yeah. which maybe can work, maybe is a poor fit. I think we need to evaluate that. What? So like there, there is something that I was like talking with um, Dave and like uh, a couple months ago where it's like, like he he kind of was like talking about a world where every module has its own store, um, a bit different than like right now because it's like all technically like one database right now. And but he's talking about like oh what if every module had like a potentially like a different database or like a subset of modules had a different database that were like heavily optimized for a certain workflow or something like that. Um, it seems like so like the, the flow here would be like the store here would be potentially like written like in the go version and then like if someone wanted let's say i guess like plugging in different store types and potentially like different languages would that be like that's like a out of scope this is like more focused around the cross lane at the like module user level yeah i mean i think to, to support different stores that's where we need to get into probably like the base app or runtime modularity where it's like like okay currently in base app we have these weird kind of state things which like only hold like a root multi-store well we could think of like this is something i was thinking about and i haven't written it up yet but we could think about like uh committers like you know are there different sorts of things that can be committed so you could have different store types then the key question is like how do they fit into life cycle into the life cycle of abci and then also how does their commitment affect like the root app hash so if we yeah. had some modular there we could do that and it could translate to cross lane but it's sort of like that's a separate kind of store base app runtime working group sort of thing yeah okay yeah just want to double check so the the missing parts that i have is like uh so adr 33 like the now it's like there's the approach that like we're taking into account like rekeying um just kind of a naive, naive question there i guess like how does a rekeying affect ADR 33? Yeah, so the way that it is in core API now is that it's based on the assumption that there is no rekeying so that a modules, like the, there's like a root module address and then there's derived module addresses which are predictable. And so that as long as that address can be predictably derived from the root, from like basically the module name, like there's ADR 28 which defines predictable ad module addresses based on the module name. So as long as the address can be Derived in that way, then we'll authorize the message in ADR33. But if we ever count rekeying, that's not at all true because there may be scenarios where, like, a, a an account starts as an externally owned account, and then we we swap out its its public key for a Cosm Wasm credential or a group credential, and then that address came from that public key. It's not derived from the module name. So then we need to like ADR33 really needs to do a check with the auth module and say, all right does this account does this address have a credential which says that the module you know foo module can call it if foo module can call it then the it's authorized um so that's yeah. that's a big change just in like the basic model there's other stuff we talked about in the auth working group which maybe we could get into separately but we talked about you know kind of giving sort of like object capability like short-term short-lived authorizations to like send coins which could be an alternative to like, um, you know, an alternative way to a permission system, which I think I actually kind of like, and that was something I think Jim was trying to bring it up as a concern. But that's that's actually that's a separate scope from just the small change about in the auth module. Like, um, does yeah. that clarify? Okay. Yeah, yeah, definitely does. Um, and then the I guess the proto reflect is just like moving to pulsar. Do we still have to? Um, we still have to make like a version where GoGo Proto and Pulsar work at the same time in the in the repo, right? I mean, yeah, that's what we're working towards now, and I, I think you know adopting Pulsar is a separate question because we started getting into the zero copy stuff. I think you know Pulsar sort of is what it is. We can we can still go that direction, but if we do want to support zero copy, then 
I would say like we don't we like zero copy would support would support proto reflect still, but I would say like if we're going that direction, we don't say hey everybody upgrade to pulsar, and then six months later say hey everybody upgrade to zero copy because that's going to be pretty painful. Well, I think well the difference here is like the zero copy approach is for like communication, not for on disk storage, right? Uh, it could be for both, like but I think yeah, it definitely is for communication. So if you like the reason why it make it, it's relevant for Golang modules is that if you are doing a lot of intermodule calls and say you have the bank module and then and then Rust modules are calling the bank module. So if you have zero copy, then you don't then you don't need to do Marshall on Marshall. If you if you have the Rust is using zero copy and Go is using Pulsar, which is like not zero copy, you have to marshal. You have to basically do this marshaling, like but on the, Marshall. Um, I guess just for clarification, there the, the zero copy would be like um, the communication and on disk serialization would be compatible. Like there'd be like just protobuf, or like the zero copy approach would be, have a different encoding. Zero copy is a different encoding, but like it would be like you could encode messages. You could encode proto messages to zero copy. You could. It's yeah. like it's like proto JSON. Proto JSON is a different type of proto encoding, so zero yeah, yeah. copy would be a different type of proto encoding. But you could still have compatibility between those things. You just have a performance hit if you need to. Like we do, if you, you know, do JSON to proto proto binary, you have a performance hit there. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm just asking questions because I think it's like, like in in a previous call we kind of talked about like oh like if we refactor Pulsar to. Uh, do zero copy of things, then it's like it, it, there is a world where it's like additional instead of like replacement, replacing. And so it's like if people want to use zero copy, they could like add an annotation and then it would like do an extra generation step to like generate the zero copy approach. And but the still like basic proto buff is like still there for people to use if they want. Does, yeah, but you feasible? wouldn't have. You wouldn't have, I don't think you'd want to have one module using both, like two sets of types. I think that just, like that was a complaint about the ORM that like, you have to have your message server using GoGo types and then you have to have your ORM using Pulsar types. Like that's kind of just weird for people. So then- the, Okay, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, like it's a, the, the zero copy would be different generated code. It would be like, a, it would be instead of Pulsar types. Like it yeah, would still it, be proto compatible, but yeah, uh, I mean, I'm just kind of like thinking like, oh, like we do want people to migrate to Pulsar to get away from Google Proto. Like that, that's of course also going to be like a hellish migration. Um, but I think they're like the zero copy is like the like you're imagining kind of like the zero copy of like um, add this field add the, like appending onto a byte stream uh, a byte buffer, um, even mm -hmm. for proto buff text that we write to disk um and is that this well, not that necessarily no no no, no. Okay. so it's just the difference between all right you generate a pulsar type it's a struct with yeah. fields and yeah. you can marshal and unmarshal that type with protobuf binary you can marshal and unmarshal it with protobuf json you could also marshal and unmarshal it with zero copy even if it's a pulsar type with if you have a type that uses zero copy native you wouldn't have fields in the struct. You would just have byte buffers and a byte buffer yeah. and getters and setters. That would be a replacement for your struct with fields. Yeah. Okay. So, so you're you're still imagining a world not, where it's like. Why, I, sorry, go ahead. why would we? It seems like we wouldn't. I mean, that's like a very specific API that's like very tightly coupled to the encoding implementation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's it seems like the API should just be structs with fields. I mean, it can, and you're just going to have a performance overhead whenever there's intermodule calls. Like that's the trade-off. If, if that trade-off is fine, then then fine. But I'm just I'm just pointing out that that's the trade-off. I mean, is, it's like the allocation and it's and it's marshaling. Yeah. And yeah, no, that's a pretty pretty clear trade-off. Like that's why we went down the zero copy rabbit hole to begin with because. Like basically, keeper call like 
we're replacing keeper calls with like intermodule calls, which use this this router system. So there's already some overhead for doing the auth authentication check. There's already like some overhead. overhead. And then if we're adding overhead of marshalling and unmarshalling, it just makes, I just don't, I just don't, I don't know if that's the direction we want to, like, I think we want to go in a more performant direction. It just feels like the easy thing to do would be to not do zero copy, but it would. Well, I don't know if any of it's really easy. Yeah. Well, it's fair to say any of it's easy. It's all pretty hard. Uh, oh, pretty hard, yeah. Uh, did, did, did we talk about and like dismiss getters and setters, like typed getters and setters as the API? Because then, then you could kind of change out what's underneath. It could be a struct of fields or it could be the buffer, bytes buffer. Yeah, I mean, the, okay, so the, yeah, I mean, as far as, the zero copy has getters and setters like you could you could sort of just abstract away the zero copy stuff but but what i'm saying is that like the type would still yeah if you could have a type that has structs and fields and just make all the fields private and it could have the same api or it could be a byte buffer then it becomes implementation detail as long as you have the same getters and setters and and wrapper types that you need for arrays and stuff Wrapper types for arrays. Why would we need those? Why, why, why couldn't the API just be a Go, GoLang standard library and then the implementation does the wrapping? It's not, zero, it's not zero copy then. It, then it's not zero copy. Like if you're, if you're copying, um, no, if you're copying something be, straight. It could, be, it could be almost zero. It could be almost zero, <laughs> very, sure. Very close but, to zero. Yeah. Sure, but it's not. It doesn't really work that way. Like it's it's it, like a go array is just not going to be a good a good structure for this because array is mutable. So then, say you append to the array, where does that go? You think you put something into to your struct, but you didn't. You actually just put it into memory, and then it gets lost whenever you marshal because the marshaling is happening based on the buffer, not based on the array. Yeah, I. Yeah, I understand. That's a sort of a limitation of Go. I mean, it could be some other generic. Go. It could be some other generic list type. There could be some <laughs> generic like list of T or something. You know, like every other language that has implemented collections has generics usually, and it's not just like array is the and map or the built-in type. It's just like list of T. You know, that would be Java or Rust or whatever. Mm -hmm. so you could do that. I think. Yeah. So I, I think there's like, I know part, part of me thinks it's like having, yeah, it's just like this extra authentication step and then like the proto Marshall Marshall is kind of just like ugly. Um, the i mean it's ugly in terms of like performance um but uh the pretty go yeah i i was wondering but do we need the authentication step like uh, can the module like simply do the authentication itself in the sense that uh, like the caller of like a certain action uh, is allowed to actually do that call well um Because like currently, what happens in in, in the SDK, like uh, at least for like non pseudo keeper calls, like set balance or or set account, etc., we already live in a paradigm in which like models are checking like who is the entity, like trying to to do a certain action, and deciding if to allow it or not. Yeah, it just like the like if we move towards a world where it's like modules don't have it, like modules don't have like pseudo power over different modules then it's like different um 
or you do something like I don't know, like Cosmosm, like actor model, where it's like you kind of like pass it to a different module. Um, and it's like the module defines what can be, what's an internal message call, and like what's an internal keeper call. And this, it's like defining a cleaner API than what we have now. And it's just like you have to do these certain things. Um, I think, I think like the, the uh, go ahead. Yeah, no, I just wanted to say that currently, like even, uh, with the change we have done to the params module like currently modules like do this like in the update params like grpc message gr grpc call they are checking if the sender is the actual authority so like uh, like sort of like we have upgraded shifter towards that paradigm yeah. for for which modules are checking like their own auth authorizations we are not we don't have like something sitting higher up Deciding if like a certain module is is, is allowed to like do but, a certain but the module the module receives the message assuming that whatever routed the message checked that did the authentication. So like what you're talking about is authorization. The module does authorization, but the module doesn't do authentication. It assumes when it receives a message that the message is authenticated. Yeah, but like if it's the runtime, like associate the caller, then we don't like. We don't need to like do anything more. Like in, in my head, at least, it's, it seems like straight straightforward. Like I'm I'm not seeing any problem. Well, how would how would like, okay would say so, okay say like just the simplest example? You're the bank module. You're in the message send handler, and that call got and you had another module that sent message send. Say say like it's the the group module that sent message send to you, and. Well, you, the, the group module, like, it, it must have had a way to, like, do that call, right? So, like, it's using the client, correct? Like, a, a sort of client, like, do that that call. And that client should, like, provide the actual I, I, identity, right? And, like, I, I, I think it, it can even be, be trusted because, so, like, it's part of, of the actual code we are running. So you're saying, like, you're saying, okay, I mean, I think what you're saying is that you could have intermodule calls which have no authentication. That, like, basically, that any module can send. Like, for instance, say, for instance, the group module sends a message send, but the address that it puts in there is the address of the staking module. Is that permitted? No, that's that's not. In fact, like we are doing that check currently in the in in the article. Like, say uh, the group module. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. I see. I see where 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 you're you're coming from, but then what I would do honestly is do like get signers, like do a, a, a get signers check. That's yeah, but then what who, I would do. how do you know? So you're doing a get signers check. That's what I'm saying. Like so, the message in the the from address is the staking module. The originating module was the group module, and say like say the group module doesn't do a check. Say we have some module that doesn't do that check. Do we just allow a module one module to impersonate another module without? authenticating that this address is controlled by the module that sent it. Do we care about that level of authentication? If we don't, then there's no, there's there's ADR 33 with zero authentication. It's just simply all modules are fully trusted and they're required to send the proper, you know, to not misbehave, which could could be viable maybe in some scenarios. I think, I think honestly, this is, this is a problem of, of the get signer approach, which we have to like deal, 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 deal with because like, it's it's like you have two people like trying to like do an action, right? You will have one one people, which is actually what you have, what 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 is returned by by get signers, and then you have the actual caller. Yeah, so but, that's where I think the the real pro problem is. Like I I have no personal reference here. Like surely, uh, I would say that like the internal router should be doing checks between like get signers and uh, like who is the actual sender. Yeah, I mean that's what we're talking about, and you know, if you consider the alternate scenario where, um, in an intermo like you just see who the sender is, and then instead of having signers in the message, you just the module receives that message. Still, then, if you're doing an intermodule call, if we have the concept of sub concept of submodules, if say for instance, if Cosmosm is sending a message on behalf of a contract. It doesn't want the receiving address to be the Cosmosm module account. It wants it to be that contracts sub account and so it still needs to have some way of authenticating as that account 
it just moves the authentication steps to inside the module as opposed to in the router. But it's still the same step, I think. Just to see if I understood correctly. So, so like say, let's imagine we have these sort of like addresses. Let's say we have contract one dot cosmosm, and then we have like cosmosm address. Yeah. Cosmosm is the actual owner of like the whole cosmosm name namespace. Yes. And you would like uh, like the call like that namespace owner to be able to like send messages on behalf of the of like uh, of like another subdomain which is like contract dot dot cosmos if that makes yeah, sense exactly yeah uh, well I I I I think as a feature it makes sense but I'm 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 not sure maybe there are these d different ways to actually do it maybe. We can do this through like the authorization system mentioned in the in the accounts RFC, in which like by by default, like we can say a namespace owner like has certain rights to like do certain things. But I'm not sure. Like I I think it might lead to like problems in which like uh, privileges are being like escalated in some ways. Like I would say like the safest assumption is that. Uh, Nobody by default can do actions on behalf of others, on, on, like unless it was like explicitly authorized and not implicitly. Yeah, I mean, so the, in terms of like the actual implementation, I'm thinking that the the authorization check could be pluggable. So you could put in like a no op check if you wanted to. And and you'd probably want scenarios where I guess what I was imagining is that like there might be some modules which have like admin privileges, meaning that they can impersonate any other account. Um, and the auth Z would be auth Z would be an example of a module that needs that sort of permissions. Like it needs to be able to impersonate any other module, but like Cosmosm doesn't. It just needs to be able to control its own modules that are owned by itself and that should have a credential which resolves to the name of the module being originating module should be Cosmosm, that check. Um, like before I was thinking that you could just do it based on address derivation, but address derivation isn't reliable if we have account rekeying. I mean, we can explore this, like, I think we should get to the point maybe where there's like a, P I'll open a PR that sometime soon that kind of look, you know, shows it and then we could take a look and study the different options. Yeah, I think that'd be useful. I think it would. I mean, like, like anything's better than the, than the current approach because the current approach treats all modules as pseudo. Where it's like, you can make a governance proposal and set the um, what is it? Uh, you can set the like the depositor of the governance proposal to be the gov account. Um, and if you set it from a different module, like it pulls funds from the module account from gov and sends it and like sends it elsewhere. And so it's like there's there's like stuff like that, or it's like if if you do that, then like do a burn that it doesn't get to the proposal phase and it burns the funds, then it's like there's not enough, then it breaks the variant and stuff like that. So it's like right now it's like we have like modules treating modules as pseudo and like kind of this like um implicit like, oh, like if there's if there's a uh, a authorization missing if there's an authorization it's happening elsewhere it's not happening on my side and and like so anything is better than the current approach i'd say yeah i mean i think the other the other consideration which we should evaluate like the the threat model but um you know so crosslink has been an idea at least in, in my head for for several years like dating back to like when adr33 was first proposed and 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 you know, app config, that's all based on the idea that there could eventually be cross slang. And the idea there is that you could have modules that get voted into existence by governance and are just loaded by like a WASM runtime. And so, I mean, yeah, they're still trusted in the sense that governance approved them, but like, should we have like, I guess, I, I think when like, when you get to the scenario where you could have modules that get loaded without even like a regular upgrade, but just sort of like a soft upgrade where it's just like a Muslim, Muslim module getting loaded, we should probably be like a little more defensive about intermodule calls than we are now, but we can reevaluate that. Maybe it is not a high threat model. model. And I think if it's pluggable, you could still, still have a, a chain which chooses to like turn off like the authentication check in, in the intermodule router if they see that there's a performance hit. Like you could have that as an option. 
just like full guard. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's there's definitely like so I think in the like in the user space or in the VM world where it's like you have um, non gov gated smart contracts like Cosmos and, and the Juno and stuff like this. Like a bit more authentication is needed while it's like at a lower layer, it's like gov communicating to another module that is not a VM can have like a, a bit more freedom, but it still needs to be like a bit better than now, I would say, because I mean, like this is like been like a larger ask from a lot of a lot of people. Um, but I think it's more so that just like the status quo right now is just not the best. And so everyone's like comparing the status quo and like saying like we need this, but like if we improve it by like five, 10, 20 percent, maybe that's maybe that's like enough or something like that. And I think that's like another question to be asked. Yeah. Um, okay. So I think that is um, So Aaron, you said you you'll do like some like uh, POC. So I think the gRPC. So do do we do we first want to focus on like the things needed in the SDK to get to the point, um, and then we work on like the loader approach. Um, and so it's like eighty or thirty three is like it's already been like planned. And so I think it's like makes sense to like just dive in the immediate term um, or short term. Dive in, like dive into like the ADR thirty three, make getting that across the finish line, um, just because it's been in the in, been in the backlog for a while now. Um, yeah, does that make sense to people? Yeah, it makes sense to me. I'm sort of, I've been thinking about this for the last ten minutes. I, I'm, uh, you know, we're talking about permissions. I'm just, uh, I'm trying to find a way where we don't where we don't where we don't make zero copy encoding like the de facto me memory management system in the SDK. Because I don't think that that's a good design. I think, it, I, I think, I think zero copy. Just, yeah, I, I, I feel like this is a, should, sorry, go ahead, Matt. I think zero copy should be something that we allow people to opt into easily if they want to, but you're not required to, restructure every get and set call that you make to an API type in your in the whole SDK if we make that the the release and like now we have these interfaces that you have to I don't know I don't know how it would look yet but I mean it, it it's super super breaking and it also means like now we have this equivocation like did we push pulsar now did we do we wait until zero copy and we're kind of just kicking the can down the road even more I mean, to get to the perfect thing instead of just releasing something that's an improvement. Well, I guess I would want to understand, like you, you said from a, like you don't want it to be the default. Like, what are your concerns? Like, other than it being go the Go API, like concerns. Like, what are the concerns around it as an encoding? Like, and well, I think it's a great idea, and I think it makes sense, and it's super attractive, and it's how things work in Rust and a lot in like C and a lot of other sane languages. It's just, it's not how Go really is written. Like Go is not really, so you have to kind of relearn how to use Go. And there's a lot of code that's already written that doesn't operate as if Go is C or Rust, because you know, it's not. Um, and I, I just think the upgrade would be like, it's, it's a, just it's just a huge paradigm shift. I don't know how it would land, um, and I don't know I don't know if it's like super realistic. Um, I don't know. That's just what I'm thinking. But like, I'm, but I think there's a way to like have zero copy accessible. That's not that doesn't require everybody because it's like if if we if if you want to make an API that's consistent for for any encoding, you have to make it as wide as possible. So we have to say, you have to use this getter and setter approach. And you have to use these wrapper types because we wanna make like anything possible. So we have to use zero copy everywhere. But I mean, is there a way to, I don't know, think about the API differently so that it's not, we're not like, I know this isn't super well formed. I hope, you, I hope somebody kind of gets what I'm saying. Like, is there a way to 
think about structuring the API so that we don't force people into like this kind of, I don't want to say ad hoc, but it's like, it's kind of ad hoc. It's like, we're inventing a, a different way of managing memory for structs and go. Um, and you have to use that if you want to use the SD, if you want to upgrade, you have to like use our, the yeah, thing that we think, invented. I, I mean, first of all, I don't think we were ever saying that this would be the only way. I think we were just saying that if you want to have the highest performance in a cross lang world, then this would be the way you have to go. But you could still use GoGo Proto, you could still use Pulsar. I think my main point was around Pulsar versus the zero copy is that like, if we are going to recommend zero copy, we shouldn't put it, we like, we shouldn't put a big push around getting everybody to migrate to Pulsar because migrating to Pulsar is going to be a big breaking change for everyone. It's a huge breaking change. Um, and so like, I, I just don't want to push two huge breaking changes. Yeah. I mean, Pulsar is breaking changes on imports and that's it, right? It's no, I mean, no, what else no, is no, no, it's, 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 it's pretty big. Like you should actually, uh, I guess I'll, there's no, no I mean, custom I have, types. I have, looked, like, I have looked a lot. I mean, I'm just like, I can't keep it all in my head at once, but so, I mean, some of the types are like, different. That's true. Like, yeah. 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 Like coins, like coins and strings and stuff like we have all those custom, all those custom go -go are, types, right? Yeah. 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 It's pretty big. I think like it's big enough that I wouldn't want to push that and then push the, the zero copy after that as like a two step thing. The, the, I mean, this, this is kind of like the, the, the confusing part for me because it's like we're, we're talking about like zero copy for like inter message passing where it's like this wouldn't be a breaking change for like inter message passing it would just because it's like the on disk serialization would still be like the cleaned up proto pulsar version because we're not using any like super custom extensions that we are using in gogo -Go proto yeah i mean the on disk serialization could could say the same could be proto f binary uh, you could use zero copy as on disk if you wanted, but you don't need to break any existing module serialization. It would just be like the the AP like the Go types would be using getters and setters as opposed to fields. Um, Freddie had his hand up. I, maybe we should. Yeah, like I just wanted to say that uh, I sort of like res resonate with some of, of Matt's concern, but more of like an ecosystem level thing. Like I think like the high hybrid approach, so like having certain modules like being uh, like super high performance with like certain APIs and then having others like using different ones. I'm not totally sure if it's going to be super nice, if that makes sense. Like it'd be super nice with some APIs using one type of part of others using Yeah, one. Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, be, be, because like if you think about it, like we are, we are gonna create like already division between like people doing things in Rust and people doing things in Go, and then you are gonna create more by having like the Go ec ecosystem split in two between like uh, classic Go like struct, and then uh, and then like having like the the zero copy struct. So I'm not saying it's it I, like I'm I'm not currently sure how how bad that might be, but uh, it's, it's it's something what to the list of concerns i think totally i mean my proposal would be to still to support gogo -Go proto like indefinitely and you know and and also support proto reflect and if we support proto reflect people can use pulsar people can use the official proto buff compiler i think we should and and like like i was saying we should they could still use gogo -Go proto so they want to stick with the current usage that's gogo -Go proto um then whether they use pulsar or not is a matter of you know their choice but we can make a choice in terms of what we recommend i think we should yeah. then work on improving the api for zero copy like can we make it a nicer api that feels like you know still uses getters and setters but maybe just is a little you know i mean the, doesn't yeah. feel like it's sorry go ahead no go on that's what I just um, I, I, yeah, I just wanted to like like talk about like the GoGo -Go Proto and Pulsar, and I think it's like for it's it's one of those things that's like for existing modules, it's like use GoGo -Go Proto unless you want to take the burden on like the store migration. For new modules, use Pulsar, and it's like yeah, it does create this like two two worlds, um, but I think it's like 
unless teams are willing to take the hit on like the store migration, like, or they just continue using Gogo Proto. Why is there a store migration? I'm I'm not following. That. I mean, wouldn't wouldn't the wouldn't the on disk representation there? There's a chance the on disk representation could be different for a few times. No, 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 no. The zero copy would still wouldn't change the on disk representation. For for Gogo Proto and Pulsar. Yeah, but they should the on disk representation should be the, the same. same. Thing. They should have the same on disk representation. Like all three of these should generate protobuf binary. Pro Gogo Proto, Pulsar, and Zero Copy should all generate protobuf binary that's equivalent. But would they would they generate the the same as like if we removed all the like custom extensions in our proto files today, like it wouldn't be the same format. As no, it would. It wouldn't change any encoding. The the extensions just change the Go code gen. It's the same encoding. Ah, uh, okay. So, so it would just be like, okay, I misunderstood that. There might, the, like the the one subtle difference would be here. The where you would run into a problem is if you had some nodes upgrade to Gogo Proto and so, like some nodes stay in Gogo Proto and some nodes upgrade to Pulsar. There could be some slight like differences that, in. That would be like a chain migration. Like yeah, if it was a chain point. migration and the whole chain migrates to Pulsar. There's no encoding breakage. Yeah. With any that, of these that, that's, any that, of that's, even that's zero copy. The way it's possible. Um, like in my opinion, like we shouldn't they shouldn't be rolling out Google Proto and Pulsar at the in a running chain. Yeah, it shouldn't be like you in a patch release you go to Pulsar because then there like there's subtle differences like field ordering could be different. That's yeah. like yeah. We use protobuf for deterministic serialization because we depend on the protobuf code generated generation being the same for all the nodes. We couldn't we couldn't support like a different implementation of our modules in Rust with a different protobuf like uh, marshalling that has subtle differences because it would be non-deterministic. It would be the same encoding, just determined like non-deterministic. I think the zero copy encoding we're designing it to be deterministic. So like you wouldn't have that concern if you wanted to have a module planted both in Go and in Rust and be compatible. Yeah. Does that make sense in terms of our encoding? No, de yeah, it definitely does. Um, yeah, I was just confused there. Um, I have to run to another call. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, but if you guys want to continue, uh, definitely feel free. That's good. I actually have to run now too. Okay, right, perfect. I think like, uh, the main act is just like continuing on ADR 33. Cool. All right, thanks everyone. Definitely.